Larissa Kozloff and I work as an artist and I'm also an activist with Extinction Rebellion. I live and work on beautiful Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong country in Nam, and I want to express my solidarity with First Nations people and acknowledge that they have been leading the fight for climate, climate justice since colonisation. First Nations people are disproportionately affected by the climate and ecological crisis. The colonial project is a major part of the problem we face and there could be no climate justice without First Nations justice. I pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded and treaties were never signed. So I'm going to start by playing a short satirical film that I made. It's seven minutes long and it's called Radical Acts. And it was made using commercial um, stock footage that was purchased online. So here we go. The climate scientists had been studying greenhouse gas emissions for over 60 years. Their data predicted altered biospheres, collapsing ecosystems, rising sea levels and extreme weather events. And yet nothing was done. Carbon emissions kept rising and their warnings were largely ignored. Fed up with inaction, the scientists decided to take matters into their own hands. They began to work on a top secret project, developing a synthetic pathogen that affected human behavior. The pathogen was transferred onto indoor plants, where it released a vapor that altered the somatic nervous system. Exposure to the plants inspired a deep sense of relaxation and playfulness. The anterior cortex became less active, reducing competitive drive and short-term memory. The plants were produced in large quantities and sold to irresponsible corporations who wanted to greenwash their office spaces. Little did they know that the plants would completely change the culture of their organizations. The changes were subtle at first. Workers began stretching more often and describing pleasant sensations in their bodies. They experienced new levels of relatedness, gathering together in groups. They made up games and forgot the purpose of their jobs. The urge to move was sometimes overwhelming. At other times, stillness took over and a deep feeling of connectedness the CEOs were baffled by their incompetent workers, and hiring new staff did little to alleviate the problems. Months of idleness went by, creating huge profit losses and a stalling economy. The scientists, on the other hand, had never been busier. Lower carbon emissions had bought them precious time and greater media interest in their work. Finally, it seemed that their message was being heard. The politicians grew increasingly nervous, fearing a backlash against their inaction. They devised a plan to distract the public by announcing a successful mission to Mars. The mission, however, could not happen in real life. There were not enough funds, nor the right technology. The mission would have to be faked using paid actors and CGI technology. A professional team was assembled and the government released footage of launch preparations and a mock press conference. The astronauts described their hopes and fears and thanked the government for their noble leadership and magnanimity. Footage was released to the public on a daily basis through social media and select news outlets. Millions of viewers tuned in to watch extraordinary scenes from planet Mars. The government praised their hard-working astronauts and the state-funded technology that had enabled such a groundbreaking mission. Hashtag our future. Hashtag getting the job done. The astronauts appeared to be thriving. They grew their own food and got along well. A future colony on Mars seemed entirely possible. Government popularity soared as a result of the successful mission. Conditions on set, however, were less than ideal. 
Tensions were developing as the crew worked long hours to meet the demand for fresh content. The actors resented their low wages and casual employment. Arguments broke out, and the actors began to leak details of the secret project to family and friends. News of the deception spread like a... <gasps> Independent journalists transmitted the story first, linking the fake mission to other cover-ups, including a global emergency that threatened all life on Earth. Evidence of a sixth mass extinction had been concealed by politicians, who downplayed the crisis and subsidized the corporations that had caused it. Honestly, you couldn't write this stuff. They knew, they knew that their actions would create immeasurable suffering, and yet they continued on with their self-centered economic mission. Neoliberal democracy had produced passive consumers rather than global citizens. And the world was in deep trouble. So what did we do? We used our privilege to lie down in radical acts of horizontality. We lay down, refusing to cooperate with the destructive fantasy of eternal economic growth. We lay down, insisting on an end to the extraction of fossil fuels. We lay down, acknowledging colonization and ecocide as the root cause of the crisis. We lay down until we were arrested and confined. And once released, we lay down again and again and again until one or both sides broke the terms. We're peaceful and united We are here for your children too We want to be non-violent Oh, how about you? So um, I want to talk about nonviolent civil disobedience today and using privilege, which the film refers to. And although it's a humorous and satirical film, the issues within it are real and unfolding as we speak. So in 2019, I reached an emotional tipping point with the bushfires in New South Wales and Victoria. I'd always gone to climate marches and understood climate and social justice issues intellectually. But there was this deep physiological response that completely changed everything. And I'm sure many of you have had a similar experience where climate grief permeates the body and suddenly you feel like you're in a different paradigm altogether. My husband and I made lifestyle changes, but we felt we had to do more. We delved deep into the science and grieved a lot. We also looked into theories of social change and realised that we could bring our bodies to this cause and use our privilege to try and create effective change. Desperate to alleviate our climate grief, we joined our local Extinction Rebellion group. The process of becoming radicalised was triggered by very strong emotions. And without these emotions, we don't feel compelled to act. There is so much emotional repression within settler colonial culture. Capitalism thrives on this. It needs us to be emotionally repressed. It needs us to be individualistic self-centred and to feel separate from one another and all living things. We live in a violently unequal world, but white, but white patriarchal culture and capitalism trains us to disconnect and to repress an emotional response. So I'm gonna pop up some images now of an action um, from last year, an example of action. So this is something that um, our group did um, in the city in Nam, and it was outside the APPEA, which is a really nasty um, lobby group for oil and gas. Um, the action involved just quickly taking over this intersection and setting up these three gates and locking on. And we held that intersection for a couple of hours. And you can see on the left there that the mainstream press were able, able to cover this action. The action was about drawing attention to a gas-led recovery 
and also an opportunity to express solidarity with the Gamilaroi people and the Gamal Means No campaign. Press interviews create an opportunity to target messaging and to stimulate emotions in other people. So when this reporter was asking me, um, you know, why are you doing this quite aggressively? I was able to say, I'm doing this for my six year old boy. And that kind of statement is difficult to dispute. It communicates the moral necessity of taking action and also the seriousness of the issue. This type of action aims to generate public awareness and shift the Overton window, which is the range of ideas that the public is willing to consider and accept. Um, it helps remove the social license of a company or a political organisation. It activates emotions and inspires others. It demonstrates allyship and solidarity, and it creates a dilemma for the police and for the courts who have to prosecute this type of action, despite the fact that it is peaceful. It messes with the system and puts pressure on the police and courts. <clears throat> so there's this thing called the 3.5% rule. And historically, no um, non-violent movement has ever failed if they achieve 3.5% turnout at a peak event. And many succeeded with way fewer than this. So in other words, if 3.5% of the population were to sit down on the road and refuse to move until their demands were met, they would win. Governments can easily ignore disruptions that only happen for a day, including marches that have hundreds of thousands of people in them, but they can't ignore sustained social, political and economic disruption. When we do these actions, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We are drawing upon the tactics and examples of countless other social justice movements and individuals who have made huge sacrifices for the greater good. So a couple of points I want to make about nonviolent civil disobedience. The first is that nonviolent direct action is not work that everyone can or should do. One of the reasons I've pushed myself into that area is because my body is safer than other bodies and I'm a reasonably, I'm reasonably um, protected through my privilege. It's not an easy thing to do, but in my view, it's nothing compared to what's coming down the road. And it's a walk in the park compared with the systemic injustices that One Nation's queer and BIPOC communities face on a daily basis. The second is that for every person putting themselves up for arrest, you need 20 people behind the scenes to make it happen. So it's a, it's a real team effort. There are vital roles such as media, region culture, outreach, um, police liaison work, uh, so many areas and people who can't be arrested for various reasons um, often do this work and you can see many of them um, there in the picture. The third is that this type of action is very well organised. The work is done with informed consent and people receive training. There are action plans and rehearsals. I think sometimes people think that civil disobedience is like a really chaotic situation unfolding, but it's actually planned very carefully. Thousands of ordinary citizens are doing this kind of work across the globe. And whilst it's challenging, it's not life threatening. In many parts of the world, environmental activists are use our privilege to support them. So I want to mention two more really um, amazing campaigns before I finish. And the first is Blockade Australia, and this has been unfolding just in the last few weeks. So this is an organisation that targets corporate and institutional power. And in the last few weeks, they've focused on the Newcastle coal mine. They executed 20 actions over 11 consecutive days and blocked the world's biggest coal port for over 65 hours, causing millions of dollars in lost income. Actions included setting up tripods across the railway, abseiling off bridges, pressing the emergency button, locking onto a parked car on the railway, and many other things. All actions were non-violent. These actions have received a huge amount of press, including international press, such as the Washington Times. They've also triggered politicians. So Barnaby Joyce has verbally attacked them through Twitter and Adam Bant has publicly defended their actions. Many of the activists are in their early twenties and it just seems unbelievable to me that they have to do this work and that the social contract is broken and the government is failing to protect their future. The second campaign I want to mention is, um, I'm hoping you can see these images, um, Insulate, 
Britain. Um, so this is a, a campaign in the UK. It's an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion. And they um, have been blocking the M25 motorway and roads in London. So a highly disruptive campaign. And they sit on the road with these banners. And what they're demanding is that the government insulate all homes in the UK. And this is a promise that Boris Johnson has never delivered on. So every year around 5,000 people die from fuel poverty or the cold in the UK and insulating the homes would prevent these deaths and create employment and reduce carbon emissions. Um, their actions have been highly disruptive and they have had a huge amount of attention in the press, um, particularly from right wing uh, media. They have faced aggression with people dragging them off the road and even squirting black, black ink in their faces, as you can see here. 39 protesters have been arrested and many of them defied injunctions going out again and again, day after day, and um, uh, despite uh, the injunctions. And nine have received jail sentences so far. And one of those people is Ben Taylor, and I just want to read his comments to the High Court. He was sentenced to six months jail um, a week ago for his peaceful actions. I want to invite you now to think very carefully about what you do next and particularly consider the gravity of the situation that you are currently in control of. Because if you do send me away to prison, 10 people or more will step forward and take my place. And if you go ahead and put all nine of us away, 100 people or more will step forward and take our place. And if you send 100 of us away, 1,000 people will step forward to take our place. You have a choice to act, to come and join us and help the tide of history, or to be a bystander and be complicit in enabling genocide. And that's exactly what's happened in the last week. So last Sunday night after the court rulings, hundreds of people hit the streets and um, there are 124 arrests. People sat down on the road and they refused to leave until late into the evening. And it created a complete dilemma for the police who didn't know what to do, an overwhelming amount of numbers. And so we're waiting to see how this develops and whether people will return again and again to the streets in peaceful action and whether um, eventually a critical mass can be achieved. So I just wanna finish with a really beautiful quote from Nelson Mandela who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I hope that you will consider supporting this type of action and perhaps becoming involved yourselves. Thanks very much.